A very good morning once again to everyone. Welcome to Time of Your Life Celebration 2022. This event is jointly organized by National Library Board and Singapore University of Social Sciences. My name is Paige and it's an honor once again to be your MC. Today we're going to talk about gerund technology in aged care. So in today's session, you will learn how we can improve the quality of care for seniors through policy making infrastructure and technology. So to ensure that everyone enjoys a seamless experience, the chat function, microphone and video will be disabled. However, for the Q&A session, you may click on the Q&A icon, which is either at the top or at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And that's where you can click in to type in your questions. And of course, if you see any questions that interest you and you would like to upvote the questions, there'll be a little thumbs up there and you can click on the thumbs up so that we can upvote the questions and we'll prioritize that for the Q&A segment. Okay, so today we will be uh, first beginning our session with a sharing by Dr. Lam Ching Choi, followed by another sharing by Mr. Tan Kwan Chik, after which we will have a dialogue session which will be moderated by Dr. Mary Ann Tao. So last but not least, we're going to have Cheng Soon, a librarian from NLB, to share with us about the NLB resources and we will also be sharing with you about the SUSS Jaren Gerontology program. Yes, the gerontology program. Uh, we will come back to that in a bit. So back to geron technology. It contributes important insight that shapes how we view seniors and aging. So through the learning points, we can improve the environments in which seniors spend their golden years. So we do hope that this online webinar will help us celebrate time of your life by diving into the physical and mental well-being of caregivers for the elderly. Okay, so today, touching on gerund technology, all right, right now, our first presentation today, pleased to have with us Dr. Lam Ching Choi, non-official member of the Executive Council of the Government of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. So he was the chairman of the Elderly Commission from 2016 to July 2022. He was also presented the Aging Asia Global Aging Influencer Award, special recognition for his devotion to public services and his influence on policymaking for the global aging trend. So Dr. Lam will be sharing about the Hong Kong's government policies on the development of gerund technology and how it can support healthy aging to realize the aging in place vision. So hi, let us invite on screen Dr. Lam. Good morning to you. Good morning. So um, as Everyone knows uh, most of the uh, metropolitan cities, just like Hong Kong, is facing a very steep uh, aging curve. And uh, you can see from this that uh, we are actually uh, a super aged society. And from this uh, uh, presentation, you can see that uh, we have uh, one characteristic uh, on our aging trend, which is it might be quite different from Singapore's one or elsewhere, is that um, very soon, uh, apart from we have uh, uh, one third of our population uh, being aged uh, beyond 65, actually we have a very significant proportion of our population uh, stated at a very high percentage um, uh, uh, even beyond uh, 10 years or 20 years later, which is the blanket of uh, those uh, aged beyond 85. And most of you uh, may know that um, while uh, you are uh, aged beyond 85, um, you will have one or more chronic disease. The prevalence uh, uh, increase sharply uh, beyond 65 and even more uh, after 85. And according to our uh, statistic, uh, which is a survey done by our hospital authority, we're also facing a very steep increase uh, in various kinds of uh, chronic diseases, including diabetes, uh, hypertension, and uh, these two will uh, lead to stroke and coronary heart disease. And uh, with these uh, double uh, 
uh, trend, uh, one in aging and uh, also one in increase in the uh, non-communicable disease. Uh, we'll see that our, the impact of aging uh, will be very huge uh, uh, in Hong Kong, especially to our uh, public uh, healthcare system. And we just, uh, uh, our University of Hong Kong just did a survey recently and uh, found that um, we have quite a steep rise in stroke uh, among our young. Uh, so this, it is, I would say, is even uh, not only a double hit, it's a triple hit uh, to our uh, public uh, healthcare system in Hong Kong. So, um, our elderly commission uh, has been um, uh, doing uh, a job all along, and finally, uh, we finished a report uh, called Elderly Service Program Plan, which which is not a very sexy term, a uh, sexy name, but uh, actually what it did is to forecast uh, the need of our aged care, especially on our long-term care, and also uh, to um, uh, advise the government uh, on the strategy ahead. And uh, as I just mentioned, uh, 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 we are having a very steep uh, aging curve and uh, the population of uh, aged beyond 85 will maintain at a very uh, high number uh, for the coming 20 years and um, we'll face a huge challenge in our uh, public health care system and uh, our long-term care system. By the way, uh, in Hong Kong system, uh, the long-term care and the hospital are under different bureaus. So um, we are also uh, 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 facing a challenge of uh, administration, how these two administrative bodies are uh, taking care of the same problem at the same time, and uh, but uh, under different uh, bureaus. So um, one of the uh, most important uh, strategies uh, we advise the government, uh, we means the elderly commission, uh, is to put in place a very important uh, direction, which is uh, aging in place. Uh, as the core, institutional care as backup. Uh, it is supported um, by most of our elderly people, uh, as stated uh, in this uh, uh, slide. You see most of our uh, older person uh, prefer to stay at home uh, rather than going to a residential care home. Despite the fact that uh, most people prefer so, but um, Quite a number of our older persons are residing uh, in our residential care home. We might be uh, the place where we have the highest percentage of our older people staying in various kinds of uh, nursing homes, um, which might uh, range from 6 to 7%, uh, de uh, depends on uh, different uh, definition. I don't know the figure in Singapore, but uh, uh, as far as I know, it is uh, the highest uh, among the, most of the OECD uh, countries and areas. And so um, it is um, a major, major uh, 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 direction change uh, uh, for our long-term care and uh, our aged care services. And apart from this, we also advise the government to use more technology uh, in our uh, long-term care setting, uh, which I will uh, tell you later. So actually, this um, important strategy, uh, which has been uh, 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 put forward to the government uh, four to five years ago, and the government adopted it, and then uh, a whole range of uh, uh, services uh, were uh, being built in, and also uh, uh, the resource allocation um, is, uh, was uh, being uh, uh, altered accordingly. And one of the outcomes uh, of this uh, elderly uh, service program plan uh, is that uh, we, we will uh, uh, develop uh, gerund technology uh, in a more vigorous uh, uh, 
uh, manner. And uh, before doing so, um, the government funded our Hong Kong Foundation to do a joint technology landscape study. And this is the first study we uh, ever have uh, in Hong Kong. And according to the study, um, we had 24 gaps and difficulties uh, identified uh, among our whole John Tech ecosystem. And uh, I won't go into details of all the 24 gaps, but I will bring your attention uh, to five main softballs of uh, joint technology development in Hong Kong. Uh, the first is a lack of awareness. Uh, that means uh, no matter is uh, 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 the service uh, recipient, uh, the older person and the family's members, but also uh, within our aged care sector, the service sector, um, we can see a very a uh, 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 stark uh, contrast uh, between our medical service and our long-term care service. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, they are under different bureaus, and the other is the culture uh, of two different sectors. The application of technology is very low uh, among our long-term care sector. So um, it is uh, uh, one of our major concern and uh, the, one of the main uh, softballs. And also, uh, we are facing uh, a lack of uh, collaboration uh, between different uh, stakeholders, universities, research institutes, NGOs, and government. And one typical example is that uh, despite the fact that we have uh, quite a number of uh, top-notch uh, universities, they are having uh, very good research uh, in various kinds of uh, technologies. But um, the technology transfer is not being encouraged uh, among our universities. So uh, despite the fact that they have very good research papers and the uh, research results are good, but uh, they are seldom being uh, put into the market. And we have other problems in collaboration too, as, just, as I mentioned. The, our long-term care system and the hospital systems are, di are under different bureaus. And uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, hear from uh, Mr. Teng, uh, uh, being uh, in the Agency of Integration for so many years. And the third main softball is the value of death. Uh, it, it is uh, very common uh, among all the startups uh, how to get the funding uh, to breach the research and the commercialization of the products. And the fourth is the lack of uh, localized adaptability, which is quite characteristic for uh, German technology. German technology is very different from uh, many other household technology or the iPhone you are using. Uh, German technology is, is uh, very specific to the local setting and very specific to the culture. And uh, I just said the, uh, one example is the language. Um, uh, many general technology are, are, are related to uh, uh, AI uh, using the big data. And uh, while you are using different languages, uh, you have a uh, different data set. And so um, one particular product which is very useful in Japan may not be useful in Hong Kong or in Singapore. And the final uh, uh, main software is the lack of uh, test beds. A lot of uh, products, uh, not only in Hong Kong, I believe so, uh, in many other places, um, these products are developed by the startups or the uh, 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 commercial companies. And most of those uh, technology were developed in the laboratory and uh, not developed in the real settings. So um, usually they will only pull up uh, the uh, uh, marketed a product uh, to the user at a very late uh, late stage and uh, for comments and uh, user feedback. But unfortunately, uh, uh, many of the time, uh, the product has been so fixed that it cannot be uh, customized uh, uh, afterwards. So, so uh, we, 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 we need quite, quite a robust uh, test bed uh, for this kind of uh, German technology. But uh, unfortunately, at that time, we don't have it in Hong Kong. So uh, we tackle 
uh, all these uh, five uh, main softballs or even other uh, gaps are uh, being identified in the report uh, in quite a robust way, I would say, uh, uh, from uh, uh, 2017 to uh, this year. We have been doing quite a lot of things. Uh, how to tackle the lack of awareness. So we, uh, we developed various kinds of programs, and the most significant one is called the Joran Tech and Innovation Expo Come Summit. Uh, it is quite a, quite a renowned name uh, in Hong Kong now, we call it GIES. So um, this has been organized by the Hong Kong SAR government and the Hong Kong Council of Social Service, and also uh, co-organized with the Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks. And it is the largest uh, joint technology public awareness program, and uh, it is, it is an annual event so far. And uh, even within the COVID, uh, we managed to uh, keep this going. As uh, you see here, uh, these pictures were taken the last year. Uh, so actually, we are, we are having this uh, GIES uh, next week. So it is a big event in Hong Kong. So as you see last year, even within the, uh, uh, well in the pandemic, we still have, we managed to have uh, more than uh, 30,000 attendees. And, and uh, some of them are users, some of them are the, uh, the, the uh, aged care uh, services operators and the government officials or the technology uh, developers. And we have uh, 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 more than uh, 160 uh, exhibitors and uh, more than uh, 600 uh, of innovation products, uh, uh, both developed locally and uh, from overseas. So, so it is a very good um, uh, platform where uh, the user, the developer, the funder, uh, they can intermingle and uh, increase the awareness uh, of the general public uh, and the sectors. And how we create uh, collaboration opportunities. Of course, we, we develop quite a number of uh, different kinds of platforms. And, and, and the one mentioned here is only one, uh, which is funded by the government uh, indirectly, uh, because it is funded by the uh, uh, Social Innovation Fund, uh, which is backed up by the government and uh, try to link up different stakeholders, uh, both on the supply side and the demand side. And uh, so uh, there is a knowledge hub uh, where everybody can go in and learn about gerund technology, uh, uh, say uh, for, for a university PhD student, uh, you can just pop in and see what are the opportunities and, uh, and uh, what uh, what, the, what is the pathway and, and where the resources are. So, so trying to bridge the, the demand and the supply side. And uh, also we try to put uh, um, different uh, stakeholders in different sectors. And, um, <clears throat> and so within this platform, uh, we have uh, everybody on the same page. And then uh, they do have a lot of different kind of uh, sharing uh, section uh, they can uh, also they can try their their idea so what they call is a proof of concept thing so so they can they can do the POC uh, right in this uh, Geron Tech platform. How about the value of death? Of course, um, um, money talks, and uh, so so the government developed quite a number uh, uh, of uh, different uh, uh, funding programs say the Innovation and Technology Venture Fund, the uh, Midstream Research Program for the universities. And uh, as I just mentioned, uh, uh, we need to motivate our university professors and the research uh, students um, try uh, to uh, engage the, the user earlier. Uh, so, so quite a number of these funding are trying to pull the user uh, in. Uh, as soon as possible um, uh, before they are uh, building their prototype. Uh, for example, this uh, Innovation and Technology Fund for Better Living, um, they, they, uh, it, it is basically is a, is a funding uh, which support uh, uh, testing, uh, testing in a real settings. Uh, uh, also, the public sector trial scheme, uh, which is 
especially SCADA for the government, uh, different departments, and uh, so that they can use the technology. And quite a number of our departments uh, are engaged in this uh, general technology development. And uh, lack of test bed. Uh, so uh, this is uh, one of the programs uh, in the Geron Technology Platform, as I just mentioned. Um, it is uh, quite a new thing uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm not sure whether there is a similar thing in Singapore. All along, uh, we have very little uh, research capacity in our long-term care setting no matter it's uh, residential care or the uh, community care sectors. Um, they, I would say 100% of the resources uh, uh, was allocated uh, to the service. So, so it is quite different uh, from the medical sector. Uh, in our public hospital, even though they are very busy, uh, quite a number of our doctors and nurses uh, were engaged in a very various kinds of uh, researches. But it's, it's, it's basically it's new, nothing uh, in our long-term care setting. So, so we need to rebuild uh, uh, this kind of uh, research culture um, uh, and also uh, trying to encourage uh, our long-term care sectors providers uh, to do some kind of research. And for Geron technology, particularly, uh, it is a testing. And, and we hope that this kind of testing uh, will develop into a kind of protocol and uh, a testing protocol. Um, since there are hundreds and thousands of uh, Geron tech products uh, developed locally and, over, and uh, overseas, and uh, as I just mentioned, they are very culture specific and setting specific. Are they useful? Uh, for Hong Kong setting, and, and even uh, among uh, Hong Kong settings, uh, um, there are different uh, uh, providers, say, uh, uh, for our self-financing home or the private home, uh, which might be quite different uh, from those homes uh, funded by the government. So, um, so we are uh, calling uh, 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 funded uh, uh, by the uh, Social and Innovation Fund, and uh, we try to build a test bed uh, among the community setting and also the residential setting uh, to test various kind of product and then uh, to develop this kind of testing protocol so that other uh, operators um, can use some of their resources. And most of the resources for now is funded by the government. Um, to test these kind of products. And, uh, but the ultimate aim is to uh, how to put in uh, the research element uh, in our long-term care setting. And <clears throat> so the, the primary objective of these uh, test beds is to pilot and document product testing and uh, to develop an evaluation framework. And uh, of course, the secondary objective is uh, uh, along this process, uh, we, we, we will test some of the products and, and, and these products are uh, uh, if being well tested and uh, they can be uh, rec regularized uh, in our system uh, so that they will get the funding to, to, to purchase or to rent uh, those kind of products. And this fund uh, uh, was also set up by the government, uh, one billion uh, Hong Kong dollar, uh, to support uh, the NGOs and the private sectors uh, to purchase or rent uh, those uh, German technology products. And they, ca they can also engage a company uh, to trial use uh, their product. And so uh, they can either buy it and just uh, use it, or um, they can. They are not sh very sure about uh, that particular product is good or not uh, for their particular setting. Uh, they can try to use it, uh, also funded uh, uh, by the government. So, uh, after a few years, uh, uh, the uh, the same organization 
uh, our Hong Kong Foundation, a think tank in Hong Kong, uh, was being engaged to do a follow-up study uh, to see how we are doing uh, after four years of uh, promotion. And these are the results. In general, uh, most of the stakeholders uh, uh, believe that uh, within these four to five years, quite a bit of improvement uh, have been uh, witnessed uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, for example, the awareness of uh, John Tech is, uh, is much improved. Um, and the government's behavior is uh, uh, much improved, uh, less uh, risk averse. Uh, and as I just mentioned, uh, German technology is so uh, setting specific that uh, I can't say the all adoption uh, is successful. So, so, so we, we, we might come up with some uh, trial and error uh, during the process. And also uh, funding uh, is uh, more available uh, after these uh, few years. But of course, there are some still, we, we, we have some gaps, for example, uh, uh, the insufficient retirement protection. What does it mean? It means that uh, uh, for our grassroots uh, user, um, of course, they can enjoy the product uh, in the centers or in the uh, residential care home. But can they use it at home? No, not for the time being, uh, because of various reasons. And they are grassroots. They don't have uh, enough money to buy it or to rent it. And uh, also, we still have some systemic issues uh, within our uh, universities we need to uh, resolve. And uh, so, so we... we, we we improved quite a bit, but we still have uh, uh, some areas to work on. And um, so uh, we just uh, the, we we just have our policy address being released uh, two weeks ago, and um, and quite a number of uh, areas uh, were being addressed uh, in this uh, uh, policy uh, address. And the first one, as just just mentioned. Uh, how a grassroots uh, user, an uh, older person who, who are homebound and uh, where uh, actually German technology can help their quality of life or rehab, re, uh, rehabilitation, uh, but they don't have enough money to buy it or to rent it. And uh, so now, uh, uh, since we have the community care service voucher scheme and uh, the government uh, recognized uh, uh, the rental uh, of these kind of uh, technology products uh, in this scheme. So they can use the voucher uh, to rent uh, the product. And, and also, uh, uh, we, we, we have built uh, infrastructure, uh, rental services uh, for these kind of products already. Uh, but that was funded by the Jockey Club in Hong Kong. And uh, so uh, a big center where they can uh, rent the product and then uh, recycle the products and uh, also to do the public education on the German technology products. So, so, so we, we have the infrastructure in place. And now uh, the government rec recognize this and, uh, and, and allow the user to use the vouchers to rent uh, this kind of product. So it is good. And also the promotion of German technology will be further strengthened uh, in various kinds of uh, services. So the government uh, recognized the problem and act on it. And so the way forward, uh, how to grow the drone tech ecosystem uh, in a sustainable manner. So uh, we, we, we uh, as I just mentioned, we, we, we do need a quite, quite a full range of support. And, uh, and no matter it's for the startup, for the commercial companies and uh, for the universities. And, um, and also, uh, uh, even uh, we are adopting uh, uh, overseas product, uh, uh, we need uh, uh, our whole mechanism being streamlined. So we still have a lot of things to do uh, along the way. And there is a huge opportunity uh, in Hong Kong and uh, what we call is the, the Northern Metropolis uh, Development Strategy, which is proposed in the last term of the government. 
And uh, this new term of the government uh, uh, will continue the effort in um, uh, building these uh, 30,000 acres of land uh, into what we call a northern metrop uh, 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 metropolis. It is an area to live in. Not, it is not only a, a tech hub. Uh, um, there are quite a number of residential development and some uh, uh, quite, quite a robust uh, infrastructure development to link up Hong Kong and Samjian. So uh, north, our northern side will be a river, a Samjian river, uh, which is the border between Hong Kong and Samjian. And so uh, all along the Samjian development is huge and uh, is, is, is a very urban, where, whereas our northern district is a relatively uh, less developed. So, uh, so it is a very ambitious uh, uh, endeavor uh, to build this uh, uh, into a tech hub and also uh, a good living area. And also, of course, uh, with our wetland park and so forth. So it is uh, uh, innovation and technology zone uh, and try to bridge uh, uh, Hong Kong and Shenzhen and also link up Hong Kong uh, to the Greater Bay Area. So um, <clears throat> in this area, uh, you see there is a uh, uh, called Suntin uh, uh, Technology Hub, where uh, my advocacy is that uh, we should use this opportunity well uh, in uh, uh, boosting the development of uh, Jaron technology. Um, and as I just mentioned, uh, Jaron technology development needs to be very specific and uh, and and very uh, well tested. So my advocacy is to uh, build a co-creation platform there <clears throat> by incorporating uh, not only the tech firms, the science park, but also to have uh, uh, elderly housing uh, for uh, various uh, uh, older person uh, from well to frail, uh, so that uh, our technology can be well tested in the real setting and also well developed in the real setting and even for the prototyping and the proof of concept can be done uh, in the real setting. And I believe uh, with this kind of uh, arrangement, our technology development uh, will be uh, 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 better enhanced and also uh, with the university research uh, in the nearby area, um, uh, all this uh, ecosystem, all this concept of co-creation uh, can be uh, in place in one place. So this is my hope, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, by doing so, uh, we'll not only develop our innovation and technology industry, but also uh, will benefit uh, our older person. And then, as I just mentioned, we are facing a very steep aging curve uh, by adopting technology. Uh, we can uh, encourage our active uh, elderly to uh, contribute to the society and also to help our frail elderly, uh, especially those uh, beyond uh, uh, age 85, uh, to live a happier life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lam, for your very insightful sharing indeed. Likewise, like both in Singapore and Hong Kong, we are both facing facing like the aging issues. And thank you so much for sharing on in terms of the Hong Kong policies on development of German technology. Okay, next up. All right, uh, do stay with us because later on we're going to have a discussion session together with Dr. Lam as well. And I do see we do have questions coming into the Q&A. Please feel free to, if you, I mean, while you are hearing the presentation, if you have questions in mind, do feel free to type in your questions because later on we will bring these questions into our dialogue session. Okay, next up for our second presentation today, we are pleased to have with us Mr. Tan Kwan Chik, Chief Executive Officer for Agency for Integrated Care. All right, and Mr. Tan's work experience spans more than two decades in the public, private, and non-profit sectors. He was also the Director for Human Resources and Talent Development in MOH Holdings Private Limited before he became the Chief Human Resources Officer at NTUC Fairprice Co-Operative Limited in Singapore. 
So Mr. Tan will be sharing about cases on how digitalization can provide a better support to an aging population and its impact on health outcomes of the overall population. So without further ado, let us bring up on screen Mr. Tan. Hi, good morning. You. Morning. Thank you so much, uh, Paige. Uh, thank you, like everybody. It? Yeah, uh, thank you, everybody, for this opportunity to speak uh, at uh, today's session. Uh, I want to first uh, thank the organizer for uh, organizing this uh, important uh, this webinar on this important topic, but also to uh, thank Dr. Lam. Each time when I meet him and hear him speak about developments, the thinking around uh, helping uh, the seniors in Hong Kong age uh, in place, I think there are many uh, learning points, uh, many uh, good practice, best practices that actually we can also look at in Singapore. I want to also thank uh, Dr. Marianne Sao, you know, for being our moderator later. She's a very key partner and thought leader for us in Singapore. We we'll also look forward to hearing from her. For my presentation this morning, uh, I would like to uh, highlight, I think, three key areas. Uh, taking, I suppose, a, a more uh, senior-centric view in terms of how we enable and empower them to age in place, to be able to live well uh, and age gracefully in Singapore, uh, but also in terms of the application of technology to empower and enable them to do so. Uh, there'll be three parts uh, in my presentation today that I would like to go through. Uh, one uh, is uh, just a quick highlight in terms of uh, our agency, which is the Agency for Integrated Care, what we do and focus on together with our partners uh, as well as our stakeholders. In the second part, uh, before we get into the technological aspect, I thought it would be good just to give uh, a quick highlight as well uh, in terms of the key developments uh, in Singapore around aged care or what we call community care, what we are putting in place together with the Ministry of Health as well as at the whole of government level to help our Singaporeans be able to age well uh, and age in place. And the third part, I will highlight quite quickly in terms of our focus on digitalization as well as leveraging on technology and the digital uh, digitalization area to be able to benefit uh, the clients as well as the seniors, our partners and service provider, as well as to help us drive uh, systemic or structural changes that we feel are important uh, going ahead uh, into the future. So in the first part, uh, just uh, to highlight in terms of what uh, my agency does. We are the Agency for Integrated Care. We are agency under the Singapore Ministry of Health. And we focus very much in terms of helping our seniors and clients to be able to live well and age gracefully in the community and at home. So when Dr. Lam you know, spoke about the, the approach or the philosophy, I think in Hong Kong, uh, to be able to really support aging in place and to have institutionalization as the last uh, resort, we adopt exactly, I think, the same philosophy in Singapore uh, uh, in terms of uh, helping our Singaporeans and our seniors to be able to live well, to be able to live at home in the community where they have lived for many years and to enable, enable and empower them to do so. And really, in terms of institutionalization or residential care, as we call it, that should actually uh, come as the last resort of care. But ultimately, it's also about, firstly, in terms of AIC's mission, empowering our seniors and our clients. And how do we help them to keep well, keep healthy, active with a peace of mind? And many dimensions that needs to go in to support that, whether it's from the physical, the mental health, emotional well-being, environmental, spiritual, or even in terms of uh, employment, financial uh, consideration. Those are important parts of how we empower and enable our seniors and our clients to be able to live well and age well. And secondly, to support that uh, very fully, we also need to be able to work together with our partners as well as our stakeholders to transform the care community. And the care community consists of different partners as well as uh, uh, stakeholders, organization that in the community helping to achieve this vision. And we will uh, in particular like to focus uh, in the next few years on how do we anchor that care in local communities. And this is where we all stay. And within the co local communities that we are you know, familiar with and we would like to each in place in, you know, how do we enable the care to be delivered out in different ways to meet the spectrum of needs and aspiration. 
And secondly, how do we also work with our partners to enable a robust, a vibrant, a very capable and future-ready sector? And that's uh, part of what uh, we do in AIC. Ultimately, we believe that care is uplifted by the power of community. And so that's what uh, we are working very hard towards. Uh, when I speak about our, our partners uh, and the community care sector, just wanted to explain that what we are talking about in Singapore is really in terms of our partners and our service provider uh, being able to provide the spectrum of services, programs and care for our Singaporeans, our seniors, our clients out in the communities. So here, broadly, we're really speaking about our partners providing center-based care that ranges you know, from uh, senior, day, uh, senior care centers to active aging centers to day hospice uh, services as well, to home-based care, which is really providing care out to our clients who are more bed bound uh, at home where they are. And that includes home medical, home rehab, uh, home hospice, and to residential care, which includes the nursing home or the residential care homes, as well as inpatient hospice and the community hospital. And so this is a spectrum of care that we see is really important to be able to support the needs of our clients, our senior out in the community. And we work with our partners very closely to provide you know, services program as well as a care to meet this spectrum out uh, in the community. And as we moved into, I suppose, uh, today's uh, uh, topic, uh, I thought also to highlight in terms of our focus uh, in, in driving, I think, key developments that we feel are essential to support uh, aging in place, to be able to support uh, the empowerment of our seniors and our clients to be able to age well. And so, you know, while we currently are still managing, you know, the, the COVID-19 uh, endemic mode, and even as we deal with the current uh, XBB uh, wave, right? Um, but, uh, and that continues, I think, to be a focus for us. Uh, we are also really uh, planning as well as putting in place key pillars to be able to prepare for the future. And similar challenges as what Dr. Lam spoke about for Hong Kong, we face that in Singapore as well. I think all these are familiar. We hope that uh, that will be, of course, uh, in the past for us, but still in terms of vigilance and what we need to deal with currently, that still has to continue. But uh, going ahead into the future, I think aging is one of the key challenges facing countries around the world. And apart from uh, climate change, the impact of digitalization, what we're dealing with in terms of pandemic and crisis, I think aging is a key challenge, well acknowledged. And many efforts are being put in by different countries to be able to manage as well as to be able to help their population age well. And so in Singapore, uh, and you will see again similar trends, as uh, what you uh, heard from Dr. Lam in Hong Kong, we also are uh, becoming a super age society. By the time we reach 2030, which is not far away, that's only eight years away, uh, one in four of us will be age 65 and above. And the needs are evolving and we see the burden of chronic diseases increasing. We also see in terms of expectation and also aspiration of our senior also evolving, you know, as, uh, you know, uh, they actually age. And so how do we actually deal and manage this and be able to meet the needs and aspiration are critical questions that we are dealing with currently. At the same time, you know, while what we call the demand side is definitely growing and will continue to grow into the future, I think we also see in terms of the need for us to be able to ensure that we are able to uh, have the manpower and the talent in the community care sector to be able to, you know, provide the care that's necessary for our aging population. But also from a financial resourcing sustainability perspective, that's something that we are very much focused on in Singapore as well. How do we build a sustainable health and social care system to be able to care for and uh, enable our seniors, not only now, but many, many years uh, going ahead into the future? So one of the very key developments uh, in Singapore uh, for the audiences, you have heard much of this, I think, but, but particularly in the recent months, is about our overall shift towards a healthier SG and so a healthier Singapore. And this is a strategic shift by the Ministry of Health. And that is uh, the white paper on healthy SG was just debated in Parliament last month. And it's really a focus to enable all Singaporeans to be as healthy and uh, as long as far as possible, moving upstream, focusing on preventive health, 
uh, and also enabling our residents, our Singaporeans to be able to enroll with a primary care provider of their choice, be able, who will actually uh, journey with them and be able to help to keep them healthy, with their conditions to help them to manage them as uh, long as well as possible. And if there are needs that arises, be able to also help link them up with community partners to get the care that they will need. So it is quite a fundamental sh shift and transformation within our healthcare sector uh, in support of Health SG. And that will be our focus, uh, I believe, actually for the next five, 10 years, where we will need to work uh, with uh, different stakeholders within the health and social care system with the health three major healthcare clusters, like right? Sing Health or Singapore Health Services, uh, National University Health System, National Health Care Group, and how do we uh, work through with them as the regional health manager in charge of the health outcomes of the population in their respective region, but really being able to focus on keeping our residents healthy and where they have needs, be able to meet them through the primary care providers, the first line of care, but linking them up actually to the community care partners, as well as our community care, uh, community partners as well, to be able to wrap the care and the services and programs to actually achieve the aim of uh, helping them to take ownership of the health, but also keeping them healthy uh, and engaged as far as possible. And so for us in uh, AIC, we are supporting the implementation of Health SG. Uh, whether it's in terms of activating the residents to enroll on Health SG, in terms of working with our partners to be able to uh, achieve, I think, stronger place-based care. And I will talk more about this subsequently. And also integrating care across uh, the spectrum and across different settings, I think, are important efforts that we are embarking on. Ultimately, it's also uh, contingent on us being able to empower, but also galvanize the whole of uh, society, the whole community effort to be able to support, I think, Healthier SG as the shift uh, into the future. So the first phase of uh, Healthier SG will roll out in the middle of next year, starting with our seniors who are age 60 and above. And uh, that's something that we're all working very hard towards. But I thought just looking maybe more specifically at aging in place, and focusing on that uh, as an example of how we are building the different uh, enablers or pillars to be able to achieve uh, place-based care or aging in place. I thought just to highlight a couple of uh, pillars uh, that we have been working on actually for the past years and how we'll build on that actually to support Healthy SG as well moving forward. One is really for AIC, we've been focusing on these three areas uh, or three uh, key uh, dimensions which we feel are important to support place-based care or aging in place. And this is what we call the touch, hold and the help or care approach. One is, you know, we, we adopt the touch approach through our outreach engagement. And this is through our silver generation office, which is the outreach arm of AIC. Uh, we have 3,000 uh, civil generation ambassadors. These are our volunteers whom we train and we engage and we deploy out. They knock on the doors of our seniors uh, systematically and uh, going down to the homes of our seniors at least once a year, be able to find out how they are, to be able to assess in terms of uh, their health, their, their social and their financial status, and to look at whether they you know, require any help services or care that we can help them to link up with. And if they are well, and most of the seniors that we actually engage through our several generation ambassadors are well and uh, supported, you know, whether it's by the family or the loved ones, I think that's, that's good. And we continue to age with them. But if they are, for example, social, socially isolated or they are in need of certain support, uh, including befrienders, that's where we can really come in to be able to help to support them. And we then link them up and uh, uh, with our providers at the local community level. And we feel this closing of what we call the last mile is extremely, extremely important. It goes right down to the homes or the seniors where they are. It's about building the trust as well as the understanding of our seniors, you know, as they age uh, in their life journey. And as we touch them, then, you know, we are also looking at how do we also help to hold them in the community at home where they are. And this is where the local community network comes in, anchored around our active aging centres. And uh, we are working through, and I'll talk about that in my next slide, uh, uh, the development of our active aging centres to be able to support our seniors at the local community level. 
lastly, if there are needs that arise and we and uh, there are areas that we feel needs to be supported, even proactively doing so, we will then link them up and help them with the care and support services. And these are typically uh, uh, sort of provided by our local uh, partners or service providers that are out there in the community. And so in connection with this, then we focus quite a bit on active aging, on befriending, as well as care and support. But also in terms of whether uh, also we can also help our seniors to be more digitally included. So digital adoption, I think, will become uh, increasingly important. Happy to talk uh, more as well in terms of our experience so far, engaging our seniors on the use of technology or connection to the internet or the use of uh, uh, smartphones. But that's also an effort that we feel is important as we move into adoption of technology in more areas, whether it's care, whether it's keeping seniors safe at home, whether it's at the system level. And maybe the, also the, the, the piece that I also spoke about, apart from the touch through our server generation office, is also the whole uh, uh, piece or pillar that we have been working on. This is where we are implementing the active aging centers. Uh, and uh, Marianne could share her experience as well, you know, uh, because uh, uh, South Foundation, I think at the Wongpo area, has been a forerunner in doing this. And we took uh, learning points and inspiration from that as well in terms of being able to work with our partners to implement. Uh, and our target is 220 active aging centers across Singapore by the time we reach 2025. At this juncture, we have appointed 119 uh, active aging centers. And these are intended to be local community nodes within the proximity of seniors in their vicinity, typically around two to 4,000 seniors, regardless of uh, socioeconomic level or flat type. We would like them, and they are actually doing so, to be able to engage, to be able to have programs to uh, for our seniors that are living in the vicinity, to be able to help if uh, they are in need of befriending services or care and support services. Proximity matters. If you talk about aging in place, I think this is one of the key pillars we feel is important to support our seniors to be able to live at home, age in place, and still be supported as you know, the age and as the need actually evolves, you know, across the life journey and, you know, towards the end also become more free. And so the government is also introducing new models and development. I thought just to highlight as well, uh, apart from what I spoke about, touch home and the care that our providers are actually provide, uh, 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 sort of ro uh, already rolling out in place, the government is introducing new models and development to support aging in place. You, uh, many of you might have heard through the news as well and the media as well in terms of the community care apartments. And these are new developments uh, built by HDB, supported by MND and MOH, where there are not only uh, senior-friendly uh, flats being built, but also wrapping around that care, support and other services to help the senior to be able to age in place. So the second project has just been launched in uh, Queensway and uh, there will be more actually in the pipeline as well. Apart from that, there recently also has been a tender launch for pilot private assisted living development. Intent is to be able to look at different models and perhaps also what public and private sector can provide in terms of developments uh, that can support our Singaporeans uh, uh, seeking to age in place. In, in the last part, uh, I've spoken quite a bit about the, the broader developments and what uh, AIC as well as MOH and uh, other parts of governments are putting in place to support uh, aging in place, uh, community care as well. Uh, in the last part, I would like to talk a little bit about Jerome technology and uh, our view of the application and the key benefits but in the impact of the usage of technology. And it, it is along three dimensions, if I, I could also uh, explain. One is really the use of technology to be able to help us support and drive uh, uh, system level changes, as well as what we call care transformation. But we also see the application of technology to be able to help our partners and our service provider change the way they deliver care, be more efficient, productive, and also to be able to uh, try out new uh, care models as well. And that's at our service provider or organizational level. Lastly, there's also the use of technology to be able to help our seniors and our clients to be able to age in place, to be able to, to, be able to uh, continue to live at home and to keep safe and healthy. And that also is extremely important. So we'd like to talk through in terms of this, and I will highlight examples 
uh, more also in terms of what we are looking at putting in place, uh, as well as uh, what maybe to come in terms of uh, uh, more to be done and, uh, you know, more efforts in terms of innovation, contextualization of such innovation to our needs here, and also in terms of scaling up of this innovation across the different groups that we see the needs, uh, where the needs are emerging. So that's something that we are working on quite uh, strongly here. I already have taken much learning, uh, many learning points from Dr. La in terms of uh, what the commission has been working with the government in Hong Kong to do. And that's something that we also need to learn more as well uh, from each other and uh, to be able to put in place. For us in AIC, I think we see Joron technology as technology ultimately as uh, the enabler or the means to enable or uh, empower our seniors uh, to live well and age gracefully. And we want to empower our seniors as they age, as their needs and aspiration changes. And that's, you know, through the technology that we use, the design of uh, and the contextualization of such technology and the matching on the environment to these needs. Uh, at the system level, if I firstly can highlight, we have launched uh, a major effort to help our communicate partners to be able to adopt uh, digital technology, to be able to drive the digitalization strategy, but ultimately to be able to benefit and impact positively on their seniors and the client through the Comcare Digital Transformation Plan or CCDTP. I apologize for the acronyms because, you know, here in Singapore, we use, in the government, we use far too many acronyms, but uh, essentially it's a, a plan to help our partners of uh, what we call our communicate organization organization be able to uplift, accelerate the digitalization effort. Within that, the focus is really helping to transform the care experience and the way that we deliver care to our clients and our seniors, transform the way that we work, and also transform the way that we connect and integrate at the system level or the sector level. Uh, this is a, a sort of roadmap or a plan with different uh, dimensions or aspects actually built in. But the core of it is really in terms of adoption of the technology, as mentioned, to be able to drive care delivery, to be able to improve productivity efficiency, and also support care integration or transformation. It is supported by enablers, uh, and uh, MOH has put in place through AIC a digitalization and productivity fund uh, of 80 million as a start, and really is intended to catalyze such effort and be able to introduce technology at the broader level, ultimately with clear outcomes and impact for our seniors and our clients. Last week, uh, we just uh, held uh, uh, a tech showcase, uh, not quite, I think, uh, at anywhere near the scale of what Dr. Lam talked about in, in terms of the conference that they hold each year. Uh, in fact, I just noted down uh, the need for us also to, to go and uh, take a look at what's available out uh, at a conference uh, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Lam. For us, I think we are starting this effort. So last week, we had our Community Care Sprint Forum. Sprint actually stands for Staff Development, Productivity, Innovation and Technology efforts to help our uh, providers sort of look at adoption of technology, whether it's a client, organizational, or at the system level. So, you know, this is still an effort that we will continue together with the tech partners. We do work closely, I think, with other agencies that are in this space, not quite in the each care sector, but uh, in other sectors, helping other sectors as well, including ASTAR, uh, IMDA, uh, as well as uh, NRF, to be able to bring technology that are suitable and contextualize adapt them to our needs here in Singapore. Uh, I would like to perhaps in the next uh, uh, few slides just highlight some examples of this technology that uh, you know we are putting in place that we are looking at adopting or scaling up and also assessing the impact ultimately like I said I think for our providers our clients our seniors as well as their caregivers and perhaps first just to highlight at the at the client service level right for the seniors client and caregivers we have uh, been putting in place, I think, using digitalization as well as access to uh, the digital uh, and internet uh, sort of resources and portals to put in place uh, 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 portals to increase accessibility to help to actually enable our Singaporeans caregivers, seniors to be able to assess resources, to be able to assess uh, programs and services, to be able to assess their records online. And this is based on the citizen-centric or client-centric perspective. So whether in terms of health hub, I think many of us use that. 
uh, M365, uh, uh, not M365, I apologize. <laughs> OT365. Uh, that's uh, rolled out by uh, Health Promotion Board, uh, as well as Moments of Life, uh, which uh, uh, GovTech has rolled out for the citizens. Uh, areas uh, or portals that are available, really to provide, again, resources, access to services program, ref uh, reference as well to those uh, programs and services and grants that we need. But ultimately, also to enable and empower us to be able to access information, uh, support services that we may require as our need changes. Uh, uh, we are developing uh, a care services recommender. And so this has not uh, yet been launched. This will be coming out quite soon this month. And I think the intent is to build on support go where. Uh, again, during COVID, we have many uh, or quite a number uh, of this go where portal, right? Mask go where, doctor go where, or GP go where. So now it's support go where. We're leveraging on those efforts uh, to be able to, again, build around uh, the citizens' needs and uh, right down to where they stay, recommend services and grants that are suitable for them, and also being able to highlight, I think, uh, services providers that are in the vicinity of where they stay. And so this is something that's coming up quite soon, and uh, we will highlight this you know, once it's launched. But apart from that, I think it's also about how do we uh, help to keep our seniors safe and well at home. And this is where technology or drone following technology, we feel play a big part. And uh, their efforts are actually uh, uh, underway to be able to uh, build in technology to help uh, to keep our seniors safe and well at home, be it in terms of helping them uh, to support or helping our seniors, uh, you know, to live at home through an ecosystem, what we call GIL, that's been developed by GovTech, put in place, you know, currently at the rental uh, flats, uh, but we hope to extend that as well. And including not just the personal alert alarm, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, is already in place, but also including fall detection system so that if our senior do uh, fall at home, there can be alert that, uh, you know, prompts us to check in and to actually be able to care for them if indeed, you know, it happens. And I think that's important as well, particularly if they are staying alone, you know, within uh, the flats that they are in. Um, that's uh, one part of it. Secondly, I think even from a client-centric point of view, we also feel it's important to help to build a safe and comfortable living environment. We're starting this, of course, for persons living in dementia, but uh, this is uh, extended to uh, those who you know, are, are aging in place. And we are really looking at senior-friendly design as well as home environment, which is suitable for us or our loved ones as we age. So we have rolled out this 360 VR, virtual reality, dementia-friendly home design guide as intended to uh, help uh, caregivers as well as uh, us to be able to look at uh, home modification, to be able to look at the home environments and uh, you know uh, changes that uh, will allow us or uh, support us to be able to live safely and well in place. So, um, you know, we'll be happy for you to, you know, assess this, to take a look, to see whether it's something that's useful for you, included the link over there. But ultimately, it's about, you know, uh, not just uh, looking at the home environment. It's about seeing, I think, uh, the world or the environment through the eyes of the seniors or persons living in dementia as well. So we are evolving that further to be able to look at how do we help caregivers experience the world, whether it's in terms of going to a supermarket, going to a local MRT station, staying at home, what are the things that they experience and how do we actually be able to cater to their needs rather than just viewing it for our own lenses. So something that we thought would be uh, really useful going ahead. Uh, apart from what I mentioned at the client's end, at the centers that uh, you know, we are working with our providers or partners on, and these uh, are our uh, senior care centers, uh, active aging centers, where our senior and client goals uh, within the proximity of their homes. We thought important in terms of leveraging our technology to enhance their experience, to be able to engage them more fully, to be able to support in terms of the health and emotional well-being, and also ultimately support them to be able to age well. And so 
so whether it's in terms of using VR uh, as uh, to enable immersive experience, uh, to actually enable uh, rehab exercises, so as to encourage them to actually uh, go through the, the therapy exercises, increase the motivation, uh, what we are looking to do. And it also goes right now to using the system to monitor the vital sign. And that's also not just from a tracking and monitoring perspective, but also increases productivity and efficiency as well. At our nursing homes, uh, uh, our providers, our partners are also looking at different areas of uh, technology. And just to highlight a few, this is not an exhaustive list at all, but just wanted to highlight in terms of usage of Jerome technology to actually help enable care, but also uh, enable our providers in terms of their care, the productivity and efficiency as well. So you will see examples here in terms of smart geofancy system so that we need not actually always adopt the approach that we need to fence up or uh, you know, lock up the doors to you know the 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 household rooms for our residents in a nursing home. If you go to our, our newer uh, nursing homes now, you know you will see that actually they are fenceless, right? We want the integration in the community. We want the community also to come in and be able to participate, volunteer to be able to engage our our residents as well. Uh, and but in sort of having this fenceless approach, you know, we also need to make sure we keep our residents safe for those who uh, have uh, dementia and may tend to actually, you know, wander or move around the facility. How do we allow them to do so without compromising our facility? That's where technology can come in. And it also includes the use of robots for different purposes, engagement, care, monitoring, as well as uh, use of uh, a care management system. This helps our nurses as well to be able to manage uh, wounds better of our residents. And again, other examples as well uh, in terms of how we can enable care better at our nursing homes, but also uh, enable their productivity efficiency. And so from medication packing system to a fall detection, uh, sort of a system to the use of robot for therapeutic purposes. Uh, just some examples. We continue to support these efforts, you know, through our uh, the digitalization roadmap, but also through our funding. But I think ultimately also looking at what is available as uh, uh, technology are suitable for us, working with our providers as well, who are also driving this very strongly in terms of adoption, but also scaling up. Just last part, I thought just quickly to highlight, perhaps looking forward as well, not just in terms of uh, delivering care, uh, not just in terms of productivity efficiency of what we do, but how do we also help to transform care a little bit more? Some of the newer efforts that are under the National Innovation Challenge, and this is, you know, uh, been funded and driven by the National Research Foundation and the Ministry of Health, and is focusing on active and confident aging. Uh, there are sort of efforts or innovation and research project around, you know, how do we enable or uh, use digitalization for connective assessment and intervention. That's one, uh, and it's using games and physical activity to be able to assess the cognitive ability of the person. And you know where there's uh, you know a concern or a decline, then how do we actually help to actually care for and provide intervention activities uh, for those individuals? So that's one part of it. But also using AI, and this is uh, something that has also been in the press a little bit more. We are working with Sing Health and Golf Tech to look at whether we can uh, build uh, AI-enabled digital tool that allows for uh, early diagnosis of dementia among higher risk groups. And so this is, you know, a multi-party effort, uh, but really leveraging our technology to proactively identify where the needs may arise and for us to then be able to uh, go a bit more upstream in terms of intervention and also provide care and support for them, including that of their caregivers and family. This is ongoing. We hope that, uh, you know, there are good outcomes that we can then scale up later on. Dementia is a growing concern for us in terms of managing this, uh, this condition among our seniors uh, going ahead. Okay. Ultimately, it's about, uh, I want to draw back, well, we talk quite a lot about uh, developments at a broader level, the use of Geron technology at uh, the client, the provider, and uh, the overall system level. I would like to draw us back, you know, in terms of, you know, our aim uh, and ultimately it is to help our seniors and be able to not just help and care for, but empower them to be able to live well in the community, to feel assured and confident, to remain active, healthy, engaged. 
and uh, to be supported by a coordinated, coordinated network of partners, which we feel uh, important, you know, going ahead at the local level where they stay, you know, and ultimately this is what we view as uh, aging in place that we need to do for our Singaporeans, our seniors. Thank you so much, everybody. The community care sector provides services in home care, centre-based care and residential care. With Singapore's rapidly ageing population, evolving client needs, rising care expectations and slowing workforce growth, the sector is faced with various challenges. The Community Care Digital Transformation Plan, or CCDTP, aims to guide the sector in their quest to accelerate digitalisation efforts to overcome these challenges. Let's hear from some community care organizations on how they use digitalization to optimize processes while enhancing care for their clients. During the pandemic, many seniors suffer the ill effects of prolonged social isolation, such as feelings of loneliness, stress and anxiety. This was compounded during the circuit breaker when our staff and volunteers could not visit the seniors at their homes. So we ventured into the remote intervention to help our seniors stay safe in their homes. This led to the creation of iBole. iBole serves as a wellness companion device that monitors the well-being of seniors and keeps them engaged in their homes. It also allows us to communicate with them remotely via video calls when needed. The personalized tablet empowers seniors to self-account for personal well-being to us every day. It also gives them a sense of security as someone is keeping a lookout for them. The immersive room was created to allow our clients to actively engage in activities and interact with each other through virtual reality. Seniors can experience what it's like to travel to places of attraction in Singapore and also around the world. They can also play games and exercise together in an environment that simulates real-life experiences. Seniors can actively participate in virtual reality games, which keep them fully engaged rather than just being passive spectators. LB piloted the Damasic Foundation FACE program, which uses AI to map positive and negative emotions of seniors in real time. The AI allows us to analyze non-verbal data from the senior's facial expressions to better understand the condition of their mental health and to detect facial emotion dissonance. This goes beyond visible facial expressions and the body language. It's useful for our befrienders at the centers to tailor their engagement with the seniors based on these readings. This can also help with timely interventions, especially when the seniors are feeling down. As part of communal living and active empowerment, we encourage our ambulant and abled residents to move freely within the designated areas. However, some residents, especially those with dementia, have the tendency to wander out unknowingly. It can be a challenge to locate them due to the size of our facility. When a tech resident moves past a IFID reader at a non-permitted area, alerts will be sent to the tablets. The last detected locations are shown, making it easier for us to locate the resident. It only takes about 10 minutes now as compared to 2 hours before. The SGS has definitely optimised our manpower and given us peace of mind to focus on more critical work. The Autonomous Mobile Robot, or AMR, is a type of delivery robot that can navigate its environment independently. Renzi is currently trialing the AMR to deliver items such as linen, meals, household supplies and medical supplies within the facility. Cares for Wounds is an AI-enabled tool for wound imaging, management and monitoring. Cares for Wounds is less painful for residents because of zero contact. It allows progress monitoring, early detection of wound worsening, and its AI prediction on healing progress also provides insights when the treatment is not working as expected. Assessment and documentation time has dropped to just one minute per wound, down from eight minutes before if manual recording was used.
Hello, I'm Dexy. I can speak English and Mandarin. I'm here to lend a helping hand to the staff and make a positive difference in the seniors' lives. Dexy is a humanoid robot developed for nursing homes. She's currently on trial at Bright Hill Evergreen Home and will make her way to other nursing homes later this year. Dexy conducts group activities such as exercises, games, sing-alongs, and even programmed conversations with residents. At NTC Health, one huge benefit from technology is a significant reduction in paperwork and man hours required to key in data manually in separate platforms. With robotic process automation, or RPA, we only need to fill in the form once, and the form data is now automatically pulled into our internal system, saving all our staff up to twelve and a half hours each day. Our staff can now use their time more productively in higher-value tasks, such as engaging more with our clients. To support the sector in their digitalization efforts. The CCDTP provides community care organisations, consultancy, curation of technology, training for the workforce, as well as funding. Please contact your AIC account manager to find out more about CCDTP. Wow, very, very impressive video indeed. And thank you so much, Mr. Tan, for your sharing. Uh, very insightful indeed. And as you share, we do receive a lot of questions coming in and we have people voting for the questions as well. And now it's time for us to move on to the dialogue session where we can discuss these questions and more insightful sharing. So where uh, we're going to invite back Dr. Lam and uh, together with Mr. Tan to discuss on the policies we can put in place to improve the environments in which seniors spend their golden years and also the quality of care for seniors. So this session will be moderated by Dr. Mary Ann Tsao but chairperson of Tao Foundation, whereby I know Dr. Mary Ann has been mentioned by both Dr. Lam and Mr. Tan. And here we are to bring her up on screen. Dr. Mary, she is the chairperson and founding director of the Tao Foundation, a Singapore-based, regionally-oriented, non-profit operational foundation dedicated to aged care and aging issues. She has also been recognized by the Singapore government as the recipient of the Public Service Medal public service staff, and many more, of course, and she has extensive experience working with disadvantaged communities. So hi, can we bring her up as well, Dr. Mary Ann? Hi, how are you? Uh, great, you great. All <laughs> We're all looking forward yeah. to meet you. <laughs> okay. okay, so, so before I hand right? over to you, I'm sorry, I mean, I would just like to also uh, once again remind our participants that if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A bottom or at the top of your screen to type in your questions. And if you see a little thumb below the questions, if that is a question you would like to ask as well, you can click on the thumb so that we can upvote these questions. All right, so I know it's uh, very exciting for us to bring the time to you. Um, we have a dialogue session. So without further ado, Dr. Mary Ann, please. Thank you. Thank you. And so uh, thank you, so, uh, Mr. Tan and everyone for the kind comments. Um, yes, I think this has been a very rich morning. Um, I'm really kind of a challenge to absorb everything being said. But clearly, as this, but the whole issue of care and technology is a very big one moving us forward. And the and when we work with older people in terms of enhancing their well-being, um, I think we've seen a very a very wonderful broad top top, uh, top level policy way how to create the environment in which every technology can thrive so that older people and the family care providers can benefit. And again, of the ground up level, seeing how some of these technologies can apply. You can see that Jaren technology can application across so many places. Um, I was just recently at the uh, a huge exhibit in Japan around the same thing. And I think definitely there's still a huge amount of effort, a focus on gerontology for the care sector, you know, for the nursing homes, residential, residential, residential care. And, um, and that's very good. But I think I think that what we must also look at and shift the products and services so that it's also to benefit the, the older person themselves as well as the caregiver at home. And I think that it's not just, I think definitely, I think that we've seen products that look at not just uh, 
um, making it more efficient and efficient for the care providers, but also ways of enhancing the quality of life of the older people. Um, recently, I was actually um, was talking to a, a colleague, well, a friend, a ex Singaporean who, who had moved to Silicon Valley and retired. And because he's been taking care of his elderly parents, started to turn his technology mind to see how can create apps and services for older people. And he had created this a platform whereby, with um, technology AI, they basically, and a very, very basic equipment, it simply turns on someone in the program, as a volunteer program administrator, can turn on the device at the older person's home. So the older person doesn't have to remember to turn it on, it just turns on and says, hello, good morning, whatever, start showing playing music and showing photographs. And this actually even works for people with dementia because it attracts attention. And then they have some pre-programmed uh, activities that goes on. And of course, a, a volunteer host will then engage about, about eight or 10 of them in a conversation and monitor their well-being and so on and so forth. And many of the older people were very isolated who didn't want to go out because of this, create a friendship group and they're more likely to be uh, to leave their home and do to social activities. So there are many, many um, um, opportunities to use gerent technology. So my question, actually, I'm looking at the questions from the audience, and it was my question, is that really how can we get this is a ground up question, is how can we get older people more engaged with the use of technology? I think that this question came up both from Mr. Lam's side in terms of lack of awareness and inability to connect with technology. And maybe um, um, I'll go to Mr. Lam first, Dr. Lam first. So in Hong Kong, you have, freedom, you have presented a really um, comprehensive view on how to create the environment, but you probably didn't even have the time to say how that would cascade down to the way it touches the lives of older people. So um, uh, one question was actually, well, how did you, how does Hong Kong take a bit of more of a ground up a, a approach as well? And a key question is how has it been able to raise awareness and get older people to adopt the use of technology? Uh, we have some difficulty with older people during COVID to use uh, iPhone and things like that. Mm. Or, um, and, and people say, well, older people can't use a product. I would say it's the wrong product for an older person. You know, so so I think that, so the question is really for both of you, but certainly for Dr. Lam is actually how in Hong Kong we're able to connect your broader picture of creating gerontech and environment to connecting to the users, the older people in the community. Uh, yeah, uh, actually these are very good questions and, and frequently being asked. And, uh, and usually asked by the younger people, not by the older people. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, the younger people worry that the older people, they, uh, they are not tech savvy enough and uh, they don't like technology, they don't like to learn and whatsoever. But according to our experience in Hong Kong, it is just the opposite. Mm. Actually, a lot of old, older people, they, they, they love technology so much. And, uh, and especially uh, nowadays, uh, especially for the German technology, the user interface is so good that sometimes even the older people, they, they, they don't aware that they are using the technology. Right. For example, uh, while we are talking about fall prevention, uh, uh, AI detection of dementia, and uh, so we put on some home monitors uh, in the senior house. And, and actually, uh, all of those uh, sensors, um, they, they don't need the involvement of the older people. It, it just sends the activities, uh, the, the, uh, when they are going to the toilet and uh, what their activity is during the nighttime, whatsoever. And so uh, since the user interface is so improved now, uh, most of the German technology, we, we found them useful, those useful ones. Uh, they don't need a lot of uh, skill and knowledge uh, on the technology. Uh, actually, from my side as a, as a policy makers, uh, we found more difficulty in integrating this kind of technology into our existing human services. Mm -hmm. That's the, e even a bigger problem uh, than uh, uh, being used by the, our seniors. So, uh, for example, in our community care, we. We're so used to have uh, a home visit and a face-to-face -face encounter. And uh, while well, we are having more monitors uh, in a senior's uh, place, um, uh, how we integrate all these alerts, signals, information with our existing human services is uh, even a bigger problem than integrating with the uh, 
uh, older person's uh, uh, daily living. So that's our experience. So mm -hmm. awareness uh, uh, is not a big problem. Um, uh, and nowadays, uh, with uh, so much programs going around in Hong Kong, and uh, once the seniors are in touch with all these technology, they, uh, most of them welcome it. So a related question for you again, Dr. Kalam, is that um, uh, so the Sing Hong Kong government has provided a lot of uh, resources for the uh, innovators, the startups, and also how to get the different sectors to collaborate. But um, one question was actually then, is a specific outreach to the practitioners to get them to use adopt technology? As you say, one of the biggest challenge is, I, I would say we have a similar thing here, speaking of my own organization, we're like technology dinosaurs, you know, because our <laughs> staff is simply resistant to using uh, technology. They think that we must hold everyone's hands and, you know, look into the mm. eyes, which is, of course, a good thing, the human touch, but also resist and using technology. So does the Hong Kong have any particular tech, uh, strategy to reach out to the providers to get them to come on board the technology train, so to speak? It's not a train we can miss, really. You know, but I think uh, I agree with this, but difficult to not even just work with older people themselves, but actually how to get a provider to get on mm. that, that platform. I think um, Mr. Tan's um, uh, uh, video shows some very wonderful innovation, but I also know a lot of our colleagues were still resisting that, including mine. <laughs> so, <laughs> so have any strategy to outreach and try to engage the providers into using mm -hmm. them? <laughs> so I, actually, the, uh, there is one interview in the video. I, I, I found the comment very, very, uh, very relevant is that actually giant technology doesn't replace human touch. Right. It's, is, uh, is to enhance, actually it enhances the human touch by uh, taking away those uh, routine work and those, uh, ten, uh, those the ten technical things. And uh, so much so that they can spend more quality time uh, with the service recipients. And, and that's the key. Initially, we, we do have this um, negative sentiment uh, among our workers because, uh, uh, of course, quite a number of those uh, technology developers, oh, they, they are selling their product. Oh, they, we, we, we can solve the, the problem of uh, manpower and, uh, and, uh, and, and cut costs and all these kind of things. So uh, it, 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 it does uh, touch the nerve of the workers. But actually, I, I don't see German technology can replace human beings. Um, right. and, uh, and also, it... It, 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 is, it is not counter human touch. Actually, it enhances human touch by, for example, uh, uh, doing those uh, transportation, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, making the, the, the manual handling of the seniors uh, more comfortable and uh, less harmful to the workers, uh, less occupational hazard, those kind of things. And uh, so, so we should see it and, 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 and that's, that's, that's exactly the challenge of sharing technology. Um, we, are, we are not talking about a technology which is disruptive, which is uh, replacing uh, some uh, uh, human behavior. Actually, it's not. We should use the sharing technology well integrated uh, in the human touch, in the face-to-face -face interaction, and uh, so much so that uh, uh, it can be enhanced. Right. Thank you for that. I think it's really important when we think about developing current technology that the expectation is not to replace whether human touch is important, but to make the, the caring work or the older person's ability to develop self-care easier and also in terms of quality of life. So actually, um, Mr. Tan has been very much involved with AIC, leading AIC, and really leading S, uh, the effort in looking at kind of the pro ground up level, the yeah. different innovations that be helpful for our seniors and our caregivers. And um, what has your experience been so far? with yeah. the agency adopting them, but it's your strategy to get the agencies to <laughs> move forward with the technology. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much, uh, Marianne. Um, and uh, we also love to hear your, your own experience. Uh, maybe first, uh, Marianne, uh, I thought to offer uh, at least AIC's perspective on the first question that you did ask uh, earlier uh, in terms of uh, receptivity, readiness of our seniors, uh, to use uh, digital technology or to have access uh, to the internet. Uh, I would, uh, at least based on uh, our outreach to senior, and this is through our server generation offers, 
uh, uh, and uh, we do ask questions uh, when we meet our senior through those uh, door to door or home visits in terms of whether firstly they are comfortable uh, using a, a smartphone or a digital device. Secondly, uh, in terms of whether they have uh, access to internet and they use uh, internet for whichever purposes, whether it's communication, for YouTube videos, or so on and so forth, right? Uh, actually, we do find that uh, the majority of our seniors do have access to internet and uses uh, digital devices. I think we looked at uh, just in terms of stats, and I just uh, checked in last night. I mean, since April this year, we've outreached to uh, around 100,000 seniors. So it's uh, just over the last uh, six or seven months. Uh, and uh, of this, actually around 80%, uh, actually 84% to be specific, uh, do have access to internet. Of this, uh, you know, uh, around 73% uh, of them actually use uh, digital device. So, you know, it concurs, I think, with what uh, Dr. Lam mentioned of the experience in Hong Kong, that actually uh, the majority of our seniors do have access, you know, are able to use the digital device. Whether that's also helped uh, by the push in Singapore, right, towards digital inclusion. Uh, and also, I think COVID-19 has, in a way, uh, uh, expedited uh, some of uh, the need to use these devices, right, as we needed to uh, go through safe distancing and all these measures. Uh, but I, I do find that that's, uh, that's one part of the experience in Singapore. Nonetheless, I think there's still a significant proportion of seniors that do not have access. So even we talk about 84%, you still have the remaining 16%. 16% out of 900,000 seniors that we have is also not a small number. So I think the effort needs to continue in terms of reaching out, engaging them, seeing how we can help them be what I call digitally included. That's an effort that we continue to undertake together with the Singapore Digital Office that's under IMDA. They have many efforts actually to reach out, whether it's to provide a subsidized access uh, to handphone and the internet, whether it's training, we work closely with them, as well as our community care providers running centers. So we're able to outreach the centers in the vicinity, have training programs, be able to help our seniors sort of get on board. A lot of times, I think the reasons that are given in terms of why seniors uh, may find challenges may not just be financial. Uh, that's one part of it, but it could be cultural, as mentioned. But uh, uh, we find that so social as well as uh, family support are actually very important to help our seniors, uh, you know, get uh, digitally included. I mean, my own parents, for example, who run soccer store, only sort of get uh, access or learn how to use WhatsApp because we are on WhatsApp all the time communicating. <laughs> and, you know, the grandchildren then taught them how to use this. So that's one dimension perhaps we can leverage on fully. Um, so that's on the senior side. On the provider's end, as mentioned, we have uh, we are rolling out a major concerted effort to help our providers adopt technology. Agree fully, again, with Dr. Lam. So, you know, we are very much aligned, I, I feel. It, our sector is what we call a high-touch, high-tech. Uh, we want, it's a high-touch uh, sector. We cannot take away uh, from that, right, in terms of the human touch and the need to provide care. What we want to do is complement that a bit more with a high-tech approach. So it's complementary. Uh, and the effort, I think, continues, not just in terms of uh, introducing technology, scaling that up and having roadmap and funding. As you mentioned, I think it's about change management as well and sustainability. Change, change management for the sense of how do we also work with our partners to look at readiness of their staff, to look at changing on a mindset and also maybe confidence to use some of this technology. I don't think we need we can sort of uh, underplay uh, the impact right of asking some of our uh, colleagues right to use newer technology if they are not trained or not assured or comfortable or confident in doing so. So how do we also go through the training competency, but also assure them in terms of how technology can help in their work, which is ultimately about providing the care to the clients and the residents. That's what, why we are in this field, right? Uh, but also in terms, the other part of it, I thought, uh, and Marianne would love to hear your view, sustainability. Very often, I find that we are good introducing uh, technology through a pilot, or we say, let's try this out, right? How do we sustain it over time so the impact is seen? That's one. Two is also how do we actually help the organizations sort of build in as part of their processes and also their sort of care model so that it is sustained over time. So I'm quite cautious about, you know, just introducing pilots or trying out something without a view of actually how do we see this fitting in overall on a sustainable basis. Uh, not oh, easy to do. I think requires a lot of feedback and um, the sort of trialing, but, uh, you know, that's something I think important to focus on as well. Marianne? 
No, absolutely. I think well, both of you highlighted some very important point. One is actually, of course, technology is to complement, not replace, but a human touch really can, makes a big difference. Secondly, is that I think there's a human factor in transformation towards a more digitally or technology oriented way. It's not just older person. When I say it's older person resistant, but actually a lot of our care staff are also in the, in the care provision is also resistant because they're very busy already and they're doing things this way. It's already, you know, whatever process is there is already taking, you know, stressing them quite a bit. So changing processes are already hard. And secondly, is the whole team, every the whole organization to come on board. And on top of it is like technology. A lot of our, our, our providers also equally not so comfortable. So I think there's a, we also have to understand what it's like to transform an organization and move the organization provides care into some kind of digital and technology savvy kind of mindset. We have to adopt the kind of a, a open-minded um, uh, mindset in terms of how can make our work easier and help us deliver a care, the quality of the care better. And I think that this is really something as it's how foundations going through this ourselves. I think that the COVID was a very help, painful but a helpful exercise. Prior to that, we're totally no tech, but because of COVID, it pushed us to change the way we practice, communicate with the seniors differently, and start to appreciate the importance of using technology um, as a crack, crack open a door for transformation. So we're actually going through a, a service model review for every single service, our day center, our home care, our care management service, and say, how can we do it better? What did we learn from, um, from COVID? One of the things we learned was that we didn't prepare our family well enough or older people well enough. So if they're providing service, it's very good. The moment with a pull back, because we can't, they can't come to a center, or we should not be going to the home so much, or older people themselves don't want to come out. And then we find that they are woefully, un, well, I won't say maybe totally unprepared, but poorly prepared. So we have to focus a lot more on just self-care, but then how to build the capability of the family caregivers and the older person themselves, whether they're well or frail, to develop the ability to provide self-care. Some of it's knowledge, some of them skills, some of them actually using technology. As you said, Dr. Lama, the technology is, is invisible. The mm -hmm. sensors and things like that, that they just work behind the scene. So I think we have to really start thinking about how can we really use technology and build up. The sustainability is an issue because can we put in something that people is consistently access, it makes it accessible, it's affordable, it's adequate, um, and, and so on and so forth. And I think that when we develop the technology, you know, adopt whether piloting a new technology or part of the use of technology, and the point in mind is that how is it that take for it to be used effectively moving forward beyond the test period? So I think there are many things for the think about was how to change the mindset of, of our workers uh, towards technology and, and not focus only on, on, on an older person. But I might say older people are not all the same either. You know, mm -hmm. we find that, of course, the 65 and 75, they're actually pretty fine, you know, uh, 75 plus, maybe a little bit, a little bit uh, trickier. And, and beyond that, of course, uh, most of them are really not savvy. So I don't think we should say older people all cannot mm -hmm. do technology. And I think that's a myth we have to debunk. And absolutely, our experience has been a really for a long time trying to help older people cross it what we call a digital divide, right? Not be able to use the digital uh, tools. And um, most of them are fascinated you know, and wanted to learn. Um, of course, some of them find it a bit more difficult, but once you get past the threshold of being afraid of using it, then they become amazing. They go from WhatsApp to Zoom. And I have one, mm -hmm. one older person we work with who got so good at putting like messages through apps that she was spreading all kinds of rumors about COVID, <laughs> wrong information through her uh, outreach network. So I guess, you know, we win some, uh, lose some, but fundamentally they became really good. They got YouTube yeah. and little videos. So some would pursue it more, others pursue less, but fundamentally it's totally, uh, I think generally speaking, a myth that older people are not capable of learning. So I think that we want to really put a point out there to debunk that, that, that myth. Uh, one more question is actually really about, um, uh, uh, let me see what someone was asking this here. Um, ah, okay. So this is not exactly related to uh, gerund technology, but it's actually a response of asking question about how um, to integrate different pieces of the services and how can help to make integration through tech. This is my addition. Like we have the uh, SGAs, 
You have the community uh, networks and you have providers and our communication amongst ourselves isn't that terrific. So um, they were asking how we connect. But my question is how can digital or te or technology help us integrate at the community level as providers um, and share information more, 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 uh, more effectively and so on and so forth. And um, my additional question to that is that because we do have uh, volunteers and others um, visiting older people and, and collecting data, how can we really um, connect those different uh, parts of data and, and get more population information out of it. So two questions, like how do you kind of make service in the community better integrated, how we to provide care and how to use better use of the data? I guess I ask that to both questions, but maybe ask Panchik first because we're kind of dealing with AACs and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Maria. Um, I would uh, acknowledge firstly uh, that uh, this is still some, uh, this is still an area that uh, work is in progress. Uh. I, I think the need for us to uh, connect and integrate uh, more strongly at the community level and also at the sector level uh, is very clear, right? Because if we talk about the need for us to be able to not just deliver uh, uh, client-centric care, but also to be able to age with uh, the seniors and the clients and to be able to meet their needs as it evolves will necessitate that. Actually, we need to be able to not just share data, but coordinate the care. And so look at the different dimensions that need to come in, right? To meet the needs where it gets more complicated, whether it's across social health or the other areas as uh, the individual ages as well and the circumstances changes. Uh, something uh, that, you know, we have been working on and Marianne also is uh, involved, but uh, I will acknowledge we at this point don't quite have a uh, technological capability that is able to cut across uh, social health sector and really sort of been more, uh, uh, in my view, client-centric. Uh, there are efforts now, as I mentioned, at the, at the info uh, and uh, the navigation level. So the Care Navigator, as uh, I mentioned earlier, built on the support go where, and this is uh, supported by uh, GovTech's expertise, mm -hmm. is an effort to support just from an information navigation perspective, right? Uh, so that, you know, we are able to have uh, use technology to be able to recommend, provide information or services, grants, programs that we may need, and based also on proximity. But that's only one, I think, one dimension of it. The other dimension of care coordination, case management, is something that actually we need to work on further as well. There are ongoing efforts based on what we call the guild system to allow at least partners in the local community to be able to be connected through a digital platform, to be able to share data, to be able to coordinate uh, uh, care needs and cases. But that is not extensive at this point in time. So that's uh, something that uh, we continue to work on, hope to actually bring newer developments uh, in terms of what we can, how we can integrate care across right uh, in the future. It is now uh, 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 expedited by the fact actually that we're moving to Healthy SG, Marianne. Because, you know, if you look at the genesis of Healthy SG, which is about moving upstream to preventive health, it is about giving uh, ownership of the health uh, uh, areas right back to the, the residents. It is about integrating care. Uh, so in terms of having the technological capability to be able to integrate care across becomes even more critical. In fact, the connection also needs to go to the GPs now, right? And the, the primary care and has to go into the social uh, care side of things. So that is actually something that's been pushed and expedited by uh, the implementation of Healthier SG. So hope, you know, it's not going to be too long into the future when we see this capability uh, that will cut across. On data sharing, uh, I think that is an area that we have been working on. And, uh, you know, while uh, there are safeguards in terms of uh, data consent and sharing based on uh, what we call uh, Personal Data Protection right? Uh, Act in Singapore, we have also uh, been working on and facilitating data sharing with proper consent and uh, to be able to share this data to our partners so that care at local level can be enabled. So for, take, for example, uh, data that uh, our SGA, uh, civil generation investors actually obtain, uh, we, we do obtain consent for the seniors to share the data uh, if uh, the need arises. And we then you know, have uh, protocols and safeguards as we share the data to our local partners and for them to be able to follow up. So one of the questions, so this is actually uh, uh, enabled actually currently at the local community level and through our collective effort. What is going to happen under Health SG, though, just to highlight it, and this is already announced by the Ministry of Health, the Singapore Ministry of Health, that there will be a health information bill. 
that's coming up. Again, to support implementation of Hakti SG, but in my view as well, it will facilitate data sharing between different partners within the ecosystem to be able to deliver the care. So that is something that's upcoming, uh, hopefully next year. And I think at the legislative level, they're able to provide the framework and the safeguard for us to be able to share data more readily and uh, you know integrating the care better, but with a proper safeguard. I think that is the one we should be looking forward to. Now it's sort of localized effort. Yeah, Maria. That'd be great. Um, I think the fundamental is so Jaren talk technology, we talk about technology, but really the IT part is equally important. Getting older people across it to the digital, across the digital divide, and making sure the care system can be better integrated because of, of, of access to information that's properly protected, you know, uh, for the patient's privacy as well. So that's, I'm glad to hear that because at the community level, we spent a lot of time and energy gathering data. And sometimes the older person gets very annoyed because different people keep asking the same things over and over again. We're not uh, really starting from a point of having enough data to work with when they're already available somewhere else. So really happy to see that coming up. Very good. Um, how about Hong Kong side, Dr. Lam? I mean, I, mean, I think I assume that we're all struggling with the same thing. C community side, we want them age in place. We're not talking about pro provision in a, an institution, but then services tend to be a little bit more fragmented in terms of how we not talk to each other, not talk to each other. So we have a Whereas older people, when they move across a different spectrum of services, maybe use multiple services at the same time. So it's really important to see how you know we can actually safely uh, share that data. And so, what is the, the state of that development in Hong Kong, Dr. Lam? Uh, yeah, we we share the same problem as uh, what uh, Mr. Tang mentioned in Singapore, and um, and there are so many things happening in Hong Kong uh, right now. Uh, we uh, we are promoting the aging in place. That's the strategy. And so a lot of uh, new community services are uh, being developed uh, in recent mm. years. And so quite a number of our seniors are taken care in the community by various kind of home care team right. and uh, discharge team and so forth. And at the same time, we're building our preventive primary care. And uh, all along, we, ha we, we do have primary care as um, uh, many other places. But our primary care is uh, more on the creative side, not on the preventive side. So, so we are building the primary care system by having a, a district health center uh, uh, in every district. We have uh, 19 districts uh, in Hong Kong. And uh, so we have a lot of uh, satellite centers. So, so we are building this infrastructure. And as just mentioned in the policy address, uh, we'll have a new uh, legal entity it's called the uh, Primary Care uh, Authority, uh, which will oversee all the primary care services. So uh, I, I did uh, see opportunity by, uh, by using the technology to integrate all the data. So the opportunity is here. But of course, uh, I believe that there will be a, a lot of hurdles and uh, how to share the data and uh, also uh, how to protect the privacy and so also in this policy address, uh, there is a mention that uh, uh, the government will consider to legalize uh, the use of uh, uh, all these uh, medical uh, records uh, across uh, in different uh, sectors. Mm. And uh, so it's a huge challenge, but also it's a huge opportunity. But I personally believe uh, the key to go is to be uh, uh, so-called patient center or citizen center. So uh, every uh, individual will own their own own uh, own their own health record. Right. And uh, so so the uh, is is uh, so much so that uh, uh, no matter where that individual goes, no matter it's a community care or primary care setting, uh, um, they will have the same. Uh, information uh, owned by that individual, and uh, so so since uh, for all along there is a complaint about our community care operators, uh, they have very little information uh, from our health departments, and uh, and also they can't uh, input into their health uh, record system, uh, despite the fact that they are collecting a huge amount of data. Uh, on the daily living, on the uh, vital sign of that individual. 
So, uh, so, so yeah, we, we still have a long way to go, but uh, apparently the roadmap is here. That's great. I think we're all kind of facing the same challenges to move primary care from just interventional curative to upstream to, yeah. to, to preventive care, early detection. I think we're also facing the same story. I just also want to say that, you know, the integration will be very good, not just only between care providers, the social care providers, the community and primary care, but good opportunity to connect those two the yep. health and social care part too. Because clearly with healthy SG, we also want our, uh, our, our GPs, our primary care physicians, to not just think only health care, only prevention, but also the social aspect. We want to understand the mental health is a major issue across the board, but particularly for our older people. But how, but though they haven't thought about this. So suddenly when they say to do social prescription, should not refer them to social care. All that's quite confusing, but I do think that this is when digitalization can, can help help them, right? Be able to say social prescription very quickly, they can refer to right, easily find something that automatically refer them to, to uh, the local agency to take care of that sort of thing and so on, or social care uh, providers. So I think this is a good opportunity when we, I'm urging every, uh, our government, when you think about uh, integrating, to integrate across with primary care and the social, not just uh, sort of the, uh, the sharing of health data, but also make it easier to mutually refer, particularly mm. from a primary care physician to social prescription, to care management, to other kinds of social services. So I think this opens a huge opportunity to look at many things. Um, I think there's a very big interest, of course, in Hong Kong, what specific gerontology products are available. I think it's a pretty different question because there's just so many, right? Yes. So I was just thinking, we have a technology, you have a technology summit, we have a technology summit. How do we make it easier to share? Of course, to physically see something is useful. But one of the same kind of virtual way of sharing those things too. And I kept thinking for myself, for our agencies, I would love it to be able to have some kind of framework to tell when I'm looking for things that serve uh, patient, um, I mean, uh, care uh, providers uh, uh, to make it easier for them to provide care, for instance, and bathing all them, kind of um, what kind of products are there or, or, or product services that make uh, um, communication easier. How can we get um, activities in the home easier? Like a framework of the different kind of categories of, 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 of functions that we look for. And then under there, what products are available? <laughs> How would someone come up with that? Because I'm really spending a lot of energy looking for things that are just everywhere, you know? But I think that we want to promote ease of use have to make it easy for people to identify the pain points, whether it's an older person themselves or the family caregiver or provider in different centers. If they say, I'm having a lot of difficulty doing X, you know, whatever a function is, then where will I find those products that can help me? You know, if someone can come up with that framework <laughs> and be able to categorize the products, it will be make, I think that will help, at least for myself, adoption easier because I'm going to spend so much time and looking for them. Looking for Mary, them. and actually, you can try our uh, drone technology platform. They have oh. a website which uh, categorizes all different kinds of uh, products. And uh, since I'm the chairman of that vetting committee, I think. I believe we have uh, uh, purchased, uh, helped to purchase uh, more than uh, 6,000 uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, technologies uh, for our various settings. So they categorize into uh, uh, different categories like uh, lifting or meals yeah. and, 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 and many different categories and uh, with many different uh, uh, products. But as I said, uh, German technology is very much different from a medical technology. Medical technology, most of them are being well tested or even a lot of research were being done uh, to have an evidence base to show their effectiveness, safety, those kind of things. But uh, so far, is, is, is most of the products are not well tested. Mm. So uh, for the next stage, uh, next stage uh, we should have a robust system uh, to test and share the results of the testing. Uh, so that the user, uh, not only knowing there is uh, this uh, particular type of uh, technology available, but also knowing the effectiveness and safety, those kind of things. You know, that's fantastic. I'm so glad I found out today. The other thing is, of course, products that just say products from overseas, they don't necessarily easily translate to con in our own context. And sometimes they're not available. So I was quite frustrated when in Japan, so I saw something wonderful, but it's not available. 
I think that the company unwilling to adapt it and the cost of adaptation is so high, it's not worth our trouble. So I think this is of whether to create our own Asian uh, database. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Singapore and Hong Kong actually share a lot of commonalities. Yeah, I think yeah. in terms That's of true. our population, Asian demographics, and sort of in a way our stage of development as well in terms of putting in general technology. And so my last question, and I guess you want each one can only have like one minute. <laughs> oh, do you have any thoughts of how um, how Singapore and 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 Hong Kong can collaborate, uh, share resources, um, and help us to move forward, both in terms of identifying products and developing products for our users, but also to you know build that environment so that whole generation technology sector can grow and be accelerated because mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of time. So maybe uh, Kwan Shik, do you want to take that question first and then Dr. Lam? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Marianne. I, I do see huge uh, potential and synergy and also uh, for, for us in Singapore to learn from the experience and also the framework I think that Dr. Lam spoke about in terms of creating that gerontology technology uh, uh, innovation ecosystem. Uh, so I think we should uh, sort of uh, discuss further and move ahead. I think info sharing is one, as you mentioned. Uh, I think there are many common needs. We can identify those and how we could potentially work together, even test bit in our respective contexts could be concretely areas that we moved on. Uh, but we'll be really happy and excited actually to work on this further with uh, Dr. Lam's support. Yeah. That's great. Thank you both very, very much. Um, being someone who's in the sector of providing care, um, I'm really, and myself, getting older myself, <laughs> and, and look forward to more products and services. I think one way of really supporting and enabling a, like a really positive longevity is to optimize the tools we can have for the older person, the family, as well as the providers in the community. So I think that on that note, I would want to thank you both um, and then turn over uh, to Paige. Paige, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mary Ann, Dr. Lam, as well as Mr. Tan for the very, very insightful discussion. And it's really a nice discussion as we are also answering questions. It's like a discussion with all our participants as well. Thank you once again. So right now, uh, next up, we will be inviting NLB's librarian, Cheng Soon. He's on the screen already. Uh, he's going to share with us some of the NLB resources. Cheng Soon, over to you. Hey, thank you, Paige. And very good morning still to everyone. Uh, all right, I will do a very quick uh, presentation in the next four minutes. I'd like to share with you just two items. Uh, the, next, the, the first item will be our NLB resources that we, are, that we have specially created for this TOYL celebration and today's topic. The second item is actually a listing of NLB senior services that we're offering to our library members. Okay, so all right on screen now is, uh, is the, 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 the first is our NLB resources. Okay, uh, we have created this one-stop resource page. To access these resources, all you need to do is to scan the QR code uh, on display. And if you prefer the clickable link, my colleague has already posted the link in the chat box for you as well. Uh, I'll be walking you through the first three options in this list, which are assessing our reading recommendations uh, and continue our learning with Udemy business, as well as downloading our self-care resource list. Next. Okay, the first title in our reading recommendation is this ebook on the left entitled The Tech Age Revolution, a book about the intersection of aging and technology. It explores the challenges of aging that are currently being tackled by technology uh, using real life stories and tech entrepreneurs and older adults, and also how we can change our te technology landscape to create a world that is more inclusive and supportive of uh, older people. The second book in the center is uh, entitled Planning for Aging uh, Society, introduces users useful concepts about placemaking uh, place in a time of a demographic shift to aging society. Uh, comparing international case studies, explore how an aging population changes all aspects of our lives. And the third reading recommendation is entitled Age in Place, a fact that's validated by a survey in Hong Kong presented by uh, Ms. Dr. Lam, as well as our Singapore speakers. Uh, it's written by Linda Strager, who is a, a geriatric expert, as she shares her knowledge in adapting the environment to increase older people's safety and independence. This book is designed to help seniors and their caregivers address new challenges together to make life at home safer, more manageable, and less stressful for all. 
Uh, next, please. Okay, in this uh, Udemy business, it's an NLB subscribe e-resource. It provides a free online learning platform for over 13,000 courses where one can learn at one's own pace uh, uh, to acquire the key business soft skills and technical topics. It's accessible to anyone with a valid uh, My Library uh, username. Next, please. And our self-care e-resource list uh, aims to provide you with a selection of resources in the areas of physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Next. Okay, this is the yeah, this is the listing of NLB senior services that I mentioned earlier. First on the list is our NLB mobile app, downloadable from the Apple App Store and Google Play Store for viewing of our free ebooks, free e newspaper e-magazines anytime, anywhere. And second on the list uh, listing is our time of a live mailing list. You're most welcome to sign up for the mailing list to receive email updates about upcoming programs and events. Uh, third on the list is NLB monthly library program suitable for people aged 50 and above. Uh, this is followed by Goodreads for the 50 plus, a dedicated publication featuring articles and uh, book reviews that, are, that covers topics such as digital literacy, wellness, sustainability, careers, and the arts. Last but not least on the listing is Envisage 2021 and Time of Life Celebration 2021. It's a video listing of recordings on our past edition of, of Time of Your Life Celebration. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Over to you, Paige. Thank you so much, Ching Soon, for your sharing. Indeed, I really like how some of the books are, you know, it's an ebook that you can actually find online. There's so much resources out there for you. We do hope you manage to click on the link that we have shared in the chat and that will be for your convenience to click to the link for all these resources. Okay, so after attending the talk about the role of during technology in aged care, I'm sure you want to learn more about the aging issues in Singapore. SUSS, Singapore University of Social Sciences, is the first university in Singapore to offer a holistic training in gerontology and topics aging studies. So SUSS offers programs from minor in applied aging studies for undergraduates and professionals to graduate certificate, diploma, master, and even PhD options as well. So students will learn about health and well-being, aging process, dementia, social policies, and gerontology technologies in aging, and many more. So to better address the Singapore aging issues, we do need a multidisciplinary team to work together. So you can be one of them to join us to manage the aging challenges and promote healthy aging together. So if you're interested uh, to study the SUSS gerontology programs, do reach out and find out more about the next intake and of course the application details. Do follow SUSS Facebook to find out more about our program and opportunities in the aged care sector.